Go into your room. That's right. Sit on that fat of yours and do nothing but listen to a record. A long journey. Um, 1985, when I first started uh, getting into this industry, and only because of music. We, we all loved music. We all had records. We all had our own systems, etc. In fact, I had to sell my car to buy my system. And part of it was made by one of the gentlemen here. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was, um, it was, it's been a, it's been a really, really pleasure journey. Um, it's hard, it's challenging, as we all know. You have to work hard. You, you have very odd hours, and we also invariably, when we have to do anything, it's on the weekend. So you get something like maybe a third of the weekends that you want to have, and those ones you have to work to catch up. But nonetheless, it has its rewards. And uh, I've been very lucky in, in the past few months to, to have uh, sort of come across people like Steve and, and Chelsea. And we started um, looking at the DG1 and why it was done and why is it coming out and, and how we wanted to introduce it. Because it has many features on there which are very unusual. Um, it's not exactly like having cars with square wheels, but it's almost, in, in hi-fi terms, we all have very set ideas about certain things because that's how they worked in the past. The problem with um, doing this turntable was we needed to hit a price point only because we wanted to make something available that we believe gave the emotional content of what you have on this little piece of plastic, um, but at a price that wouldn't be seriously damaging your bank account or needing mortgages and things like this. The problem then came that you try to down engineer. I mean, if you go from the RG1, which is the top model that we do with the reference tone arm to the SG to the MG, there are lots of similarities um, and it's basically trying to cut the cost down of certain components in the design but then you get to the point where you have like a threshold you start going below this and you lose what it is that you want to achieve at the end and that pushes you back to the square one to sort of think okay I can't just make the material cheaper, I can't just make the motor cheaper, I can't do this, so let's look at what is important, what do I need, what don't I need. Luckily, when, when I was doing the reference uh, tone arm for the, for the RG1, I was looking at all sorts of bearings and how we can make the bearing better, how we can tolerance it better, how we can do this, and then I suddenly realized, actually, I don't need a rotary bearing. Unlike the, the platter itself, where it has to go constantly round and round and round, on a tone arm, you only go from here to there and up and down by about a couple of centimeters. So I can maybe get away with something like a hinge rather than a bearing and have a material that is not sliding, so it doesn't have any properties like stiction because the arm is constantly moving up and down and it's constantly going left to right. Doesn't matter how flat you make the record or how centered you make it, it will still, within the dimensions of a groove, still going left to right and still going up and down. And every time it changes direction, it has to come to a stop and then move the other way and then come to a stop, move the other way. And when it stops, it has to overcome stiction to move if there is a sliding surface. If you have a membrane, it's only bending. And then the stiction part of it becomes microscopic into the molecules, and there aren't any. One other advantage you have with something that there is no sliding surface is that there is no noise. You don't generate any inherent noise in the system. If we go back to um, like 87 or whatever it was, um, I came up with, with a bearing system for, for the Artemis, which actually didn't have any tension in it. 
because as soon as you get a ball race, um, you try to take up the slack in the bearing. This is not because you don't, if you have a movement in the bearing, you're gonna lose the information in the groove because it is, would be impossible to have a bearing of, I don't know, even 100 grams that it will stay in the air. So whatever bearing system you have, the weight of the item would actually will have a physical contact. But what it does is that when it's rotating, it creates noise, like a bicycle wheel. So when you start tensioning the two bearings together, you're taking up that slack, you reduce that noise, but at the expense of the stiction. Because friction is property of the two surfaces, but also the force that is pushed against each other. Now, with this DG1, I was thinking maybe, maybe I can do the same thing as we did with the reference tone arm, but do it a little bit different. And you have, we have seen all in the past millions of different designs that come out and, and you get ideas from some of them, but you put them on the shelf and you come back to it, you go back to it, you come back. And with this, I thought there is a possibility that we can use some kind of a thread system for the bearings that does exactly the job of the movement of the bearing. If there are any forces that are put on, they are required. So for example, if you take the vertical bearing on there, there's a nylon thread which is twisted, it's got I don't know, thousands of threads in there. And once the arm is moving towards the center, obviously the, the string is twisting. And you think, okay, I can actually use this as my anti-skate. So it becomes part of the anti-skate. It's not enough. But then you think, okay, I can twist the thread even more. So suddenly you lose the necessity for a relatively expensive item in your tone arm. And you think, okay, this has got flexibility. So what is the frequency? If the frequency is below the audio band, and the mass of the arm, in this case, somewhere around 180 grams, with the cartridge, the cantilever forces that are driven onto the cantilever won't be able to move that mass. Um, <clears throat> if we look at um, cartridge, everybody says the cartridge tracks the record. It doesn't actually track the record. It's almost like having a car, but not driving it into the bends, having it hung, and having the road pulled under it. It needs to react to the road. It's not in the hands of the driver that can say, oh, I can't take this corner quite that sharp. I take it a little bit more round. The cartridge doesn't have that luxury. This wall comes at it at enormous speed. And if you think about, if you think about frequency, even something like 15K, which is not a, a huge uh, ask on a, on a piece of vinyl, is shooting backwards and forwards in one second 15,000 times. And if you look at centimeter wise, it can be pushed around, around a thousand times or more within one centimeter. But we are lucky because it's very light. <coughs> If you look at the cantilever and the diamond, it's fractions of a gram. And the tone arm is hundreds of grams. So you have huge advantage. It's almost like having a big juggernaut and the antenna is your cantilever. If you think of the, the tone arm that way, then when you're moving the cantilever on the, on the cartridge, especially in the audio band, it finds it very difficult to transfer that into the body of the juggernaut and, and move it around. So using the masses and where the center of gravities are, I managed to get the cost of the tone arm to much lower than, for example, our next level of tone arm that we have. Also, in order to avoid 
having multiple joints and things that you have to work out. Am I using glue? What kind of glue it is? Am I using uh, pressing? What kind of pressing do I have, etc. It's one piece from the beginning to the end. So one end, the cartridge mounts onto, the other end is the cantilever. And in the middle, you've got the nylon bearings. And with the nylon bearings, actually, I'm using two for the vertical movement. So they're staggered on the same axis as the cartridge. So when it's going up and down, it's actually keeping parallel to the records. It's almost like a pivoted. Oh. And vertically, there's one thread that runs to the bottom, and it can be tensioned from the bottom, so we can set it, so we know what the tension is in there, so we know what the frequency of the arm, um, whatever we want to set it at, we can set that. But you also have another advantage, is that there are two weights. One weight is the counterbalancing weight, and another weight is for putting the tracking weight on. Now, if, for example, you needed more effective mass, you can use one of the weights further out and the other one further in. And if you need it less effective mass, you go the other way. So you have a bit more flexibility as to how you set up the, the arm. Once the, this part was sorted, the tone arm part was sorted, I had more budget for the deck. So I thought, okay, we don't compromise on the bearing. We don't compromise on the motor, we don't compromise on the pulley. The drive system is almost identical to what we have in all the decks, albeit slightly smaller. The, here was where we reduced the cost of the components. BTA, etc., everything is done. And it makes it much easier for the less analog conversant people to actually start enjoying vinyl. Because you, you think vinyl has come back. I mean, it never went. But it was only used by people like us. The normal people, well, normal, not that we're abnormal, but the general public, they, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're all abnormal. <laughs> They, they, they needed some convenience. And, and, and also from the advertising, they always thought that you know, vinyl is dead. Well, it's far from being dead. Um, and it's growing. But I think in order to keep it going, we need to make it accessible to people that, again, they don't need to take a mortgage to afford the systems. And if we start here, and if we can persuade some of the record companies that yes, they do their very big boxes at 70, 100 pounds, etc. Can they also make a simple one for 30 quid now that they've done all the remastering and everything? I think we can actually have this going even much, much further. And I think it'd be a really, really good future for everybody in the industry if we engage with the general public and not just audiophile sector.